So good morning and welcome to the Ninth Circuit. Judge Wynn and I are also very happy to welcome our colleague, Judge Huck from uh, the Southern District of Florida. He has sat with us before and we welcome him back. Good morning. So good morning. And the first case for argument today is McCall versus Jacobitz. You may proceed. Thank you. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Ryan Daniels. I represent officers Jacobitz, Munsenmeyer, Hafen, and Ramirez Marillo. May I reserve two minutes for rebuttal? Yes, you have a clock there, and I'll also try to help you as well. Appreciate it. Thank you. This appeal raises three purely legal questions. First, given the undisputed facts in this case, did officers Jacobitz and Munsenmeyer violate clearly established law when they handcuffed Mr. McCall for safety purposes. Second, did, uh, based on the undisputed facts in this case, did, uh, were officers Hafen and Marie, uh, Ramirez Murillo clearly integral participants in the continued handcuffing and um, detention of Mr. McCall simply because they brought the D security to the, to issue a trespass warning to Mr. McCall and then waited approximately three minutes while they um, trespassed him. Third and final, uh, based on the undisputed facts, were the officers, or did the officers in this case clearly establish, uh, violate clearly established law by um, holding Mr. McCall so that he could issue him a trespass warning? The answer to each of these questions is no. The officers did not violate clearly established law and they are entitled to qualified immunity. And because this appeal um, concerns the application of law to uh, undisputed facts and even facts that are in, um, construed in the favor of Mr. McCall, this court has jurisdiction to hear this appeal. Um, as to the handcuffing of Mr. McCall, the district court failed to consider under Miles that Jacobitz and that Jacobitz and Munsenmeyer were permitted to handcuff McCall for legitimate safety reasons. The court uh, didn't consider the fact that the officers were um, holding him or had, had detained him because he was a narcotic suspect. And as a narcotic suspect, they were permitted under Dillard, uh, cited in this case, to um, assume that he was armed. Um, they so, also excuse have, me. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Uh, assuming that's true, did there come a time when they realized he was not a drug suspect? At that point, did the right to detain him terminate? The court, the, assuming that's true, the court found that there was a that was a, there was a question of fact. At what point did they determine that he was no longer a drug suspect? Um, there was a factual issue of whether or not um, they were still waiting for the other side of the investigation to confirm that there were other suspects in the area and that they had been trafficked. But your client's own words were, we have nothing on you, which is pretty indicative that they finally came to the conclusion he was not a suspect at that time. Is that the point where they should have unhandcuffed him and released him? Uh, if they... Well, assuming that's, assuming that's true, assuming what I just said, that that fact was in favor of Mr. McCall, then yes, they probably should have um, released him. Um, uh, but that, you know, that's a factual question because that, you know, and that's, and this appeal doesn't concern that, that particular moment in time when they released him. Well, it does because he, I think the, one of the arguments is that even if there was an initial right to stop him, Terry stop, once that, suspicion had, had been set aside that he was then to be released so it's, there may be a fact as to exactly when that release should have taken place but there seems to be no controversy that the release should have taken place at some point and it didn't okay. and so this brings to the point of whether or not they should have uh, whether or not it's clearly established law that they couldn't detain him for purposes of issuing the trespass warning well I would go back let me just follow up on Judge Huck and the handcuffing because you know you have a suspect it seems to me that if you look at the cases um del vizio lambert out of the ninth circuit that 
you don't have an automatic right to handcuff somebody on a Terry stop. And even if you assume potentially that somebody with a claim of drugs could be armed, um, as soon as they stop him, frisk him, there's no weapon there. He's cooperative, putting the facts most favorable to him. I don't see any basis for the handcuffing. What is your best case on that? The best case is that, well, you know, again, I guess the case, the Dillard case where they could assume that he was armed and they, they frisked him, this is true, but then he continued to, uh, he was a, he was a large, he's a large, he had a, he was bigger than both of the officers and they were in a crowded casino. And just because he wasn't violent at that point doesn't mean that he could eventually become well, this, more. You know, that's a lot of speculation on speculation. You got a guy who's outmanned by the officers. Um, he might be in a casino, but we have these stops all the time. And under your theory, you would always have the right to handcuff. And that's not what the cases say. And, you know, watching the video and seeing how it all played out, taking the facts most favorable to him, I'm hard pressed to understand under what authority that we would adopt your position? What legal authority? Well, the legal authority, there are several factors that you can consider. You know, even the Lambert, they, they, uh, Lambert said that, um, uh, that, you know, you have to found that there were no other extraordinary circumstances involved. So it's not that there are discrete facts. There are a multitude of facts that you can consider. And I'm not saying that in every well, let's case- let's look at the Lambert facts then. They talk about, um, he's uncooperative or takes action, looks like he's going to flee. That didn't happen here. Information that he's armed. Well, we can assume for at least a nanosecond before they frisk him that he might have um, an arm. That he's uh, where there's a violent crime. No, we don't have anything. Where there's information that the crime may involve violence that's about to occur. We don't have that. So we don't have any of those factors here. And that's what's giving me pause. So I'm really looking to give you the benefit of the doubt to see if there's another, there's a case that we should really be looking at that um, would support your position. Uh, well, I guess I, I'm going to refer to Michigan v. Summers, which is a case that says that when you're searching a, uh, a uh, narcotic suspect that you you can you can be concerned with the fact that they might be erratic and violent just because he's not just because he's being cooperative now doesn't mean that he won't suddenly become uncooperative when for perhaps uh, uh, one of his comrades or one of his narcotics trafficking colleagues was in the area and he was trying to signal to them or or they help him out or, or something like that those are all things that you know, I think Michigan v. Summers understands that there are those extenuating circumstances that then cause causes a uh, a, higher, a heightened concern. And I, on, I on the trespass issue, what what confounds me is that um, they're not going to give him a citation. Um, so, what's the authority for keeping him so that a private entity can arrive to give not even a warning but some kind of citation well the authority is you know that's part of the issue is that there is an authority saying that they can't do that either um and that's why there's they should be entitled to qualified immunity there's no authority stating that they have to um that they, that they can't hold them for purposes of um, well, well, well <laughs> go ahead no please but, but there is authority yeah. and you cited a case from my state <clears throat> A JMC for the proposition that you can't detain solely for the purpose of seeing if uh, a warrant is going to be issued or a citation for trespass. But you don't point out that that was a divided court, uh, one judge suggesting that might be the case, and that every decision in the Florida uh, state court as well as uh, a district court have held just the opposite consistently. And But that's 
there, and do you expect the officers to understand the legal techni technicalities that a judge, one, that one judge, um, suggested as a possibility that they could detain? I mean, we're not. We're hold, this is a qualified immunity case. This is not clearly established law from these jurisdictions. There is no Ninth Circuit on point authority for this proposition. And it's true. What, and then my last point about the, uh, the Florida case is that they don't consider a, 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 tra um, a detention of a narcotic suspect coupled with the trespass warning. The, so the detention of a narcotics subject who's been cleared of that potential crime. Uh, we've used up your time in questioning, but I'm going to give you a minute for rebuttal. So don't worry about that. Okay, thank you. You may proceed. Hey, please, the court. Robert Mercesian appearing for Leticia McCall, the administratrix of Darius McCall, the initial plaintiff in this litigation. Good morning, your honors. <clears throat> Let me start where... Uh, Mr. Daniels ended. Um, we're not dealing with legal technicalities and there are indeed express instructions as to when this is to stop. And it doesn't relate in any way to whether or not they can continue to hold pursuant to NRS 207.200 or for a private trespass to be issued. Specifically, I would cite to Terry v. Ohio. It stops when the purpose of the stop is completed. Secondly, and Florida versus Royer as well. Moreover, when we're looking at those two cases, it is also clear that the only purpose that is allowable is a Terry stop, which is to investigate and dispel suspicious circumstances. I also want to highlight something for the court here, um, and that is this alleged uh, narcotics suspicion. This is not a case where there was suspicion of narcotics. This is a case where they've bootstrapped suspicion into trying to figure out if there is suspicion of narcotics. Everybody agrees that what they had was a picture of three African Americans on Fremont Street talking. Nobody saw any drugs. Nobody saw a drug transaction. There were no drugs. This is suspicion of suspicion. And that was one of the reasons why that part of the case, which has been determined essentially uh, against me as to the initial stop, was brought as well. Um, let me... Excuse me. But, yes, the officer, but then the officers uh, get information from the D's security staff that they thought that there was a drug transaction going on? They got a picture of three black men talking and the personal opinion of the um, security manager that he thought it might be a drug transaction. But he, this had been observed over a period of time, no? Uh, they say so, but there is no direct evidence of that, Your Honor. Well, Further, we <laughs> they have, say so. That, that's how police we, respond is to say I, so's. I believe Mr. McCall's affidavit sets out that this did not occur over a period of time, that he talks to people all the time, that he didn't even have a recollection of speaking to the men in that photo, because that's his job. But I don't want to belabor that point. I, I understand what the court is saying. Um, well, let me ask I, you, are you suggesting that they had no right to even stop and inquire, ask the name? You want to, um, not, not, first of all, the escalation of authority should have started with a consensual encounter. <coughs> Penn was at work. They saw him. They observed him out front. They saw him talking to people. And instead, they waited until he walked up the stairs, had to use the restroom. That's why people approach a restroom. And was put up against the wall and held against his will. And I want to highlight Officer Musenmeyer's testimony because there seems to be some question and they're trying to justify the handcuffing because this is a narcotics investigation. Her testimony says that the handcuffing is justified because that's what we do in a Terry stop. As the district court pointed out, we have direct evidence from the officer involved that they routinely handcuff during a Terry stop. No equivocation, no citing to narcotics authority, this is what the Las Vegas police do. 
Um, Your Honor, turning to this idea of a trespass where the defendant brought up, or yes, the defendant's counsel brought up the idea that um, this is, again, this has not been decided. It most certainly has been decided. I would cite also to the court, though, um, in their reply at page 7, Note two, they attempt to say what we're doing here is we are actually applying the criminal law and therefore this is authorized under um, Terry, et cetera. Your Honor, that's in no sense what they were doing. The statute, NRS 207.200, bespeaks no police involvement or government involvement at this stage whatsoever. To say that there is no authority against them, they exercise a perceived right or duty that is antithetical to the statute. The statute says exactly who can do it, an owner or an occupant. Jacobitz wasn't one, and they, even then they still can't stop the person. We cited, we cited plenty of case law about that, but they continue to hold a person under authority that is only granted to an owner or an occupant, even if it does exist, and certainly not granted to the police or the government. Um, I Let me focus on one particular moment in time so that the court can get a better grasp of what's going on here. This is decidedly poor police practice and unreasonable police practice. And if the court is looking for an example, let's go to the point where, as the just, as, you, as you have pointed out, it appeared that everything was done, they've reached their decision, and yet they're continuing to hold Mr. Um, McCall solely for the purpose of allowing a private trespass to occur, trespass warning to occur from the... Um, the D. At that point, he's been told he's going to be. He's been told that they're done, and they are indeed done. And I would again cite to the video. You can watch from that point forward. This this mythical third group or second group of police officers didn't exist. Souter Souter testified he was that second. Part, and they weren't in any way looking for any other two people. They were off on a different adventure apart from what these officers were doing. That is an aside, though. Here they are. They're done. Mr. McCall is seating in the, sitting in the seat. And now he's told, you have to stay here while we hold you in handcuffs and try to hurt you. Try to take away your restaurant. Try to take away the restroom you use at work. Try to take away your night activities. We're going to see if they want to trespass you. Well, that gratuitous action, I want to point out what it's coupled with. And I would cite to the Musenmeyer video at uh, 7.03 p.m. After they've done all of this, up comes the security officer at the D. He looks at Mr. McCall and starts to read him a trespass warning. Mr. McCall legitimately says, what is this about? What did I do? Why are you doing this to me? Okay. Reasonable questions, certainly within his rights. What does Mr. Officer Jacobitz, Sergeant Jacobitz, the head of this patrol, say to him? And I'm quoting here. You want to make an issue? We'll just take you to jail. Everything is done, and this man is still in Mr. McCall's personal space while he's handcuffed, threatening him with incarceration because he isn't smiling and taking it. Your Honors, in the United States, nobody has to smile and take it, but Mr. McCall did, and they're in here today saying to you, And even after he did, we still could hold him in handcuffs. And they did still hold him in handcuffs. This is a violation of his right to be free of unreasonable seizure personified. Um, I would ask the court, and I don't want to go over um, 
Does the court have any specific questions? There is not. Wow, that is easy. <laughs> okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, I will, I guess, shut off my uh, video now, or my mute, my sound. Thank you. All right. Um, we'll go back to um, Mr. Daniels. And if you would put a minute on the clock, please. Thank you, Ms. Gates. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, just two things real quick. The, the point about the, the uh, court had already determined as a matter of law that they were, the officers had reasonable suspicion to detain, initially detain uh, Mr. McCall. Uh, but going back to the issue of qualified immunity and about holding the uh, Mr. McCall for the purposes of trespassing him, qualified immunity is allows breathing room, allows the officers, officers breathing room to make reasonable, but perhaps mistaken judgments about open legal questions. And I just reiterate that this is an open legal question of whether or not they could detain him for purposes of trespassing. The statute implies some amount of detention in order to give the warning. Um, and then, uh, so in order to, to warn someone and to eventually trespass them, they have to be given that warning. Um, and I think that the, uh, the, compu or the, the, the state of the law coming out of Florida suggests that there is no clearly established law on this point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for the argument this morning. McCall versus Jacobitz is submitted.